Welcome everybody, thanks for coming and, and welcome to the second stage of our Labiotech Refresh event. Um, we're now going to have a, a panel discussion about um, the current and sort of future trends thinking 2019, 2020 um, in biotech and what's sort of hot right now. Um, I have a great panel with me here today. So I've got Alexander Belcredi from Fagramed. He uh, worked in the Boston Consulting Group and then set up uh, recognizing the problems of the antimicrobial resistance issue. He set up a company using phage to um, target this. Um, then Vanessa King here is from Virion Therapeutics, uh, but also um, has a VC hat on from, <laughs> from Abingworth um, and is looking at antivirals targeting flu. And then we have Eric Tauber here, who is the co-founder and CEO of, of Themis, um, looking at infectious disease vaccines, but also, um, I think, moving into the onco-immune space, perhaps. <laughs> um, so um, I wonder if we could, we could start off. Um, there's been some great discussion. Thank you, for Verna, and thank you, Philip, for that introduction. It was, it was great. Um, I think those are all really important topics, but I, I'm interested to hear a bit more about perhaps something that's, that doesn't seem to be going away is, is cancer immunotherapy. So I wonder, I mean, it, this space seems to be getting more and more crowded over time. Um, Eric, I know, as I mentioned, you're, you're, you're moving towards oncolytic vaccines. I mean, do you think there's still room for innovation in this space? Um, there's lots of uh, innovation still needed. Uh, and I think that there are many reasons why many companies are moving into immuno-oncology. Like, I met companies who said uh, we started off with infectious diseases because we were young and needed the money, but now we are the cancer experts. And this is not what we are doing. Uh, so we are really uh, experts in uh, vaccinology, experts in infectious diseases, but we happen to have a great vector which has a great biological activity which can kill cancer. So there's a natural reason for us to go into cancer. And uh, we believe that, uh, well, we know that uh, a virus is a great tool to bring RNA into the system, to modulate the immune system. So uh, it was not a question that uh, we woke up in the morning and said, uh, what kind of innovation field is needed and we go into cancer like everybody else. So it was really a natural transformation of us. Okay. I mean, looking at the field more in general, I mean, I don't know. Um, it seems like it's quite full. I don't know what you have. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask, uh, Eric, what you've encountered when, again, you go out and start telling that story. Because uh, with my Abingworth Venture Partner hat on, certainly we see companies with lots of very interesting approaches. And at the same time, because the field is so crowded now, the pipeline is, you know, so many things are moving through the pipeline, it becomes very difficult for us to handicap just how competitive the particular new modality is going to be when it finally makes its way to the clinic, because there's so many mm. other solutions moving already ahead of it. Yeah, I mean, even, I mean, I hear now that a lot of people are moving, almost taking immunotherapy into the autoimmune space. Um, so people who've, like, started off doing the cancer side of things, so looking at kind of uh, CAR T cells or, t uh, you know, T, t regs for that. Well, especially with, with other developments kind of orthogonally in, in the immunological space where folks are realizing, you know, just the breadth of diseases that uh, should be tractable that way. Mm, okay. Um, so, I mean, what about, I mean, I was hearing yesterday that uh, bispecific antibodies are now coming into their own and, and that actually someone was making the argument that... Um, because the, the, you know, things like CAR-T are so expensive now and um, that that's, you know, there's this pricing issue, but actually these, you know, there's a space for them as well and actually they, um, you know, they're cheaper to manufacture, it's sort of easier. I mean, what, what do you think about that? You know, I don't, I'd turn it over to one of my colleagues here. I don't have that much <laughs> pers perspective on bispecific. I even counted tri-specific. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you have any comments on that or... All I can tell you is a friend of mine who has started his company nine years ago together with my com as I started the company, sold his company for bispecific antibodies a long time ago and uh, is doing <laughs> altruistic things now. Ah, okay. So, uh, <laughs> so, so I you wish him good luck on the royalty stream that comes. Uh. <laughs> so, I mean, so moving more into the sort of cell therapy side of things, of course, that's getting a lot of attention at the moment with the, the two CAR-T cell therapies being approved last year um, and also in other areas. I mean, do you, but do you think it's really ready for the big time yet? I mean, is this something we're going to see um, more of in 2019, 2020? 
Um, let me start by answering that one and then kick it over okay, as well. Sure. I mean, from uh, certainly uh, what I'm seeing is a lot more deal flow in the cell therapy space and not necessarily all oncology even. Um, we at Abingworth view cell and gene therapy actually not similarly because clearly they're very different beasts, but at the same time, as you were just alluding to, you know, you're delivering into cells, maybe you're mod 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 uh, mod modulating or somehow changing those cells. The risks we see when it comes to actually developing it are fairly similar. So mm -hmm. yeah, we're seeing a huge amount of that, but also a lot of the technologies and platforms it needs uh, you are going to need to make those opportunities real. Um, so companies like Magenta and others um, in the States, I think, are really working, okay, what is it going to take to make it so that these are successful in patients around the, all of the conditioning and other aspects there? Mm. So, did you have any thoughts I on mean, that? Maybe just, um, I'm in the antibiotic space, so it's very different, and I'm, sure. I'm also not sort of a scientist from background, but maybe one observation from attending a lot of biotech conferences, I think there's an enormous breadth of technologies out there in terms of new oncological technologies, and some of them we've talked about. What I find always astonishing is the expectation to get an extremely high price point for them, mm. plus the very high development costs to actually get to something which you've taken for all the phases, and then maybe a market that is actually quite segmented in where you go to. Mm. So I think just from an outside, it would seem that there are probably some technologies there which are really worth the scientific bet to, to take them all the way. But I would also expect that we have so many different ones now that probably one or two will be the winners along the way and some others are maybe not that good business cases to take. That's just. So do you think that's more of a, a sort of a long-term thing, so not perhaps something we're going to see in, in the next year or so, but perhaps more in the next sort of five years, perhaps? I think it's an open question to the guys who are more right, familiar yeah. with that. Yeah, is, is how do we distinguish yeah. from between all those great technologies that are out there to the ones which maybe can justify a high price point and the others which right. maybe are... I wonder, I mean, because we, we certainly, I certainly have a lot of conversation with friends and, fam friends and family in the industry about what role payers are going to play for each different types of modality in the future. Um, it strikes me that the posture we have to take, because that's an, what is it, a known unknown, is look at all the is that that will be for the companies themselves to shape and the development strategies themselves. Yes, there may be more pressure, but there still will be highly you know recompensed. I have to hope therapeutics out there. Otherwise, therapeutic innovation is going to stop. And so I have to think that you know I used to I came actually into therapeutics from the tools space, and there I just remember the numerous examples of you know people had the most brilliant technology but had a crappy communicate, you know, had a crappy uh, development plan and then commercialization strategy and those beautiful technologies that you really wanted to use in your R&D lab, you never got to see really industrialized. Whereas people had like Affymetrics arrays, which had huge amounts of limitations and yet they had a great marketing engine behind it and they were successful in the marketplace. So I wonder if it's gonna be a similar thing where it really is for the development teams of these new modalities themselves to prove their utility to design the clinical studies accordingly. Mm. Did you have any thoughts on that, Eric? I think prices and developing cycles are uh, maybe one of the most difficult things to overcome. Uh, when uh, we look into modern therapy, we still follow the classical uh, approval timelines of, I don't know, 15 years, uh, 50 years for a dengue vaccine mm. or something like this. And uh, still when I talk to strategic investors, uh, VC firms, the question which comes first is how do you do, how do you think about reimbursement? Which doesn't make sense uh, when you mm. look uh, for in a, into a 20 years uh, <laughs> development cycle. So I, I believe transformation will also come here into the understanding, but I don't know if we are young enough to <laughs> see. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I guess they need to sort of sort, so, I mean, that's maybe something we'll see in the next couple of years is that the uh, regulatory authorities are actually going to have to really take on board these new therapies and really make some changes, so, yeah. uh, on the way they, um, they regulate things and actually... Um, both in the cell and the gene therapy space, I think. And, and the question is going to be, you know, what provides the incentive to them to do that? Because, mm. because at least uh, in our interactions with the regulatory agencies, you have p highly dedicated teams of people who clearly want to, excel, you know, get new drugs to patients and protect the, the, you know, the population. But there's that sort of lever for systemic change we haven't seen very much of at the, at the you know, lower to mid level. So, for example. Um, we're working at Virion on a broad spectrum antiviral for respiratory virus diseases. Well, there's no trodden development path for this yet. 
that for single you know, viral diseases there are. And so we've, you know, we're two years still plus from the clinic, but we're already having a discussion uh, with the appropriate folks. On the other hand, sorry, with the folks at the regulatory agencies. <laughs> On the other hand, it's not always the appropriate folks that you yeah. can get in the room, and we're kind of now in this interesting political moment of, you know, okay, these people, you know, took our project on and gave us our, our pre-IND meeting. Okay, but these other people need to be in the room. How do you tell the folks there, you know, who needs to be in the room? Well, gently, obviously, but yeah. anyways, but so I think that this innovation in the regulatory piece is gonna continue to be something that will impact all of our lives, but I wish I knew how to, to help incentivize it. Mm, okay. Um, so, I mean, so maybe moving on a bit. So, I mean, I think gene therapy is another another sort of hot area. And, I mean, since the approval of Lux Turner in both the Europe and the US last year, um, I think there seems to be a lot more people working in the gene therapy space. I mean, what do you think we should look out for in, in 2020? Any exciting things on the horizon, do you think? I mean, I'll start with an area that's near and dear to my heart. And then, and again, I uh, would love to hear Eric and Alexander. The um, uh, gene therapy in the brain, I think, is mm -hmm. an interesting area that I've been hearing more and more about. I guess there have been a few high-profile cases um, which, where this has been done experimentally and not in a drug discovery setting uh, in, very severe, in patients with very severe phenotypes, so it was acceptable to IRBs. And I think uh, that, for me, um, especially given how, especially, as with last week's you know, failure of the mm -hmm. Alzheimer's drug from Biogen, um, we see that we really need different approaches, transformative approaches, as Werner said, in neuroscience. So for me, gene therapy in the brain is an area I'm very interested in and seeing more in, but what about you guys? I think maybe just picking up on one point that Werner raised, I think the question of maybe not so much the direct gene therapy, but understanding the genome and how we can use that information to make better disease choices, better treatment choices. I think that's extremely interesting as well. And I think that can shape, again, why do certain people get certain diseases? Why do they persist in some people, whereas in others they're, they're cleared? If we can use that to be more targeted, I think that can be helpful it's maybe beyond the, the pure gene therapy. How about you, Eric? I would expect gene therapy to really, for the next, well, for the near term, uh, focus or, or have the, the priority for neglected diseases, orphan diseases. Also due to the fact that uh, regulatory agencies or regulatory trends will be slower than we might wish. Mm. But uh, also sometimes gene therapy has effects which are difficult to predict. Yeah. And uh, I would expect uh, that uh, people and especially society will be extremely careful. Well, I mean, of course, there's, um, they've now treated the first patients in the first CRISPR yes. study, CRISPR therapeutics. So, I mean, that's something I'm, I'm personally looking forward to. I want to, to see how that, how that goes and mm -hmm. see whether, um, whether that's successful. I guess that's something we can only wait and see. But um, uh, could I add one course, thing, sorry, yeah, before yeah, we leave uh, yeah. the gene therapy field. I, just one thing I think it's important for all of us who really want to drive innovation in these areas yeah. to also consider is the, the full, in a way, innovation system that any particular type of therapy is going to need. The reason I bring it up in this case is that um, I think it was just in the last 24 hours that I think was it that one of the large companies was it Thermo Fisher brought yes. a gene synthesis yes, I think you're right. company yes. for a group of former Genzyme folks who were doing in a way the manufacturing side of gene ther cell and gene therapy. Mm. And the reason I wanted to flag it is that I think that for us as venture folks or for me as a small company CEO thinking of scaling up a novel modality, actually access to those sort to the CMC and that manufacturing mm. can be a tremendously gating factor. And so we, for example. In our company, we're looking just to, to generate some plasmids at a certain high, um, you know, fidelity and with high QC. Well, for the folks who are generating those for real gene therapy um, companies, the big ones, the slots are booked out. It's literally millions of dollars just to get, you know, for us what is a first step along many. And we're not the only company that that face this. And then where do you find a high quality alternative? So really, the things beyond the the bi biological innovation but the systemic, again, innovation um, are, again, I, I, don't, I think those are great business opportunities for folks uh, that are you know, in, related to what we all do uh, and enabling to it, mm. but can also stand in the way. Of course, yeah. I mean, I think um, in, also in, in 2018, um, another approval we saw was the, the first ever RNA interference drug, 
um, and, and also obviously the, the historic IPO of Moderna in, um, towards the end of the year. I mean, do you think 2019, 2020 is the, I mean, 2019 the year of RNA therapeutics? I mean, <laughs> I guess hey, you I run an RNA biased. therapeutics company, so I have to say that. <laughs> what are you guys seeing in the marketplace? <laughs> I mean, what we're doing is uh, we use a viral system which uh, brings RNA into the immune system. Mm. So uh, we are a bit jealous to see <laughs> mRNA companies uh, uh, worth a billion dollars, uh, yeah. or five, or six, or seven, mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> then look into viral vector companies which do clinically the same, sometimes with much higher effectiveness. And uh, so, I, I have a very jealous point on, on this. <laughs> 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 what, what you? Well, I'm always jealous, yeah, because I'm, I'm in a space which is much more challenging in terms of pricing and, and reimbursement. So I think, yeah, it, yeah it's interesting to look at these other fields. Um, it's not that, that easy to translate how that would figure out in, in terms of what we're doing. But I mean, I think it's been a while in coming, the RNA thing. I mm. mean, they've been developing RNA therapies for a long time, right? So I was going to say, yeah, I mean, a decade ago, you would not have had that same sense. You know, there were more, much more on the bleeding edge and folks were, you know, wondering whether this would ever happen. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. It has been a long time in coming, but it does seem to be the moment. Yeah, no, so that's, that's interesting. So, I mean, Something that Werner brought up, and I think it's very important, is the you know the antimicrobial um, space and and um, antimicrobial resistance. I know that a lot of people have trouble getting investment in this area, but I mean I know that's something you're working on, Alexander. Can you? Um, I mean, do you think what's exciting coming up, and what what should we look for in this year and next? So I think what's very exciting is that many more stakeholders are realizing that this is a problem. So actually, mm -hmm. to pick up on the regulatory facts on the last conferences that we went to on AMR, but also on the phage field, the FDA is always there. They mm. always send representatives, um, the EMA is there, the Paul Ehrlich Institute is there. They are starting to move ahead a lot in terms of trying to understand what would help the field because the political pressure is really ramping up. Mm. It's not yet translating that much into the, the venture side, into the investment side, on a sort of more institutional investor side. But then again, you have um, Novo Nordisk with the repair fund, which has made a big, mm. big change in the industry. You have Carbex. So I think we're slowly... The realization is, is starting to dawn, I think, on everybody that it's a problem we can't neglect. And so I would expect that to continue in 2019, 2020. I mean, you're using quite a sort of innovative way to target the problem. I mean, are there, are there any other interesting things coming out that you know, we should look, be looking out for? I think there, there is still a lot of debate on, on what's the right, the, right, mm. what, the right approach that we go for. So I think the, the first reality is, is we need many different ones. If you're trying to treat a sepsis, you want to have a broad spectrum antibiotic and you want to have a small molecule that's reliable. If I'm treating a recurrent urinary tract infection, I do not <coughs> want to destroy the vaginal microbiome every time by using a broad spectrum antibiotic. So I think the first realization is we need many different classes of antibacterials or, or antibiotics. Um, and then I think there are some exciting vaccine approaches that are happening. I mm. think there are some exciting phage approaches happening, prophylactic, synthetic, natural, um, endolysins will have a, a role to play. So I think the technologies are out there. The question is, how do we get enough of them into proper clinical trials and get enough of them on the market at the end to actually solve the problem that we're having? Mm. I think that's 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 true. Um, so I mean that actually that sort of segues quite nicely into another big area at the moment. I mean the microbiome is a sort of a, a bit of a hot buzzword at the moment. I mean if you're de if you're somebody who's developing an antimicrobial, that must be something that's sort of on your mind about. Now we've all this evidence is coming out to show how um, how important it is not to disrupt the microbiome too much. I mean, what do you think? I mean, it, I, I know this, this is quite an early stage the field, but. Uh, I think uh, it's, it certainly must be something that you're considering. Look, I think if you can claim microbiome or you can claim CRISPR-Cas into your company, that's great, and <laughs> it would give you an immediate buzz. I think the... So with phages as well, we can talk about microbiome modulation. The reality that I feel is that there are many papers out there that show a link between this one bacteria or this, this one type of, of setting in your gut and, and some result or some oncological trial failing. My question is always, how sure are you? If I'm going to take out a Clostridium difficile, is that really going to make a difference? And how much am I willing to bet on that as, mm. a, as a young company, especially? Yeah, so I think the microbiome field still has a lot of, of space to go before it's fully understood yeah. into what links into what, because we're not just dealing with 
a single one, one thing that has an effect here. We're having something that's extremely complex, which we probably understand, I don't know, 10, 15% right. of it at the moment. Mm, that point of scale, and when you said me as a small company and would I consider it, was uh, reinforced to me earlier today. I was chatting with a friend um, in a big pharma company, and I was like, yeah, so let's talk about the whole microbiome thing, because I knew it was a particular interest of his. And he was, it was very, you know, big pharma answer, but highly informative, which was, you know, yeah, we're, you know, we're very interested in the area, not at all convinced that any of the approaches out there currently are going to lead to drugs, but monitoring that, monitoring it with high interest. So it's like they're letting somebody else, you know, kind of lead the way. But interestingly, you know, saying we really want to understand the systems here, to your point about having one data point or two data points and like really understanding the whole picture, we've got a group of 50, literally, we've got a group of 50 to 60 people working on this. I was like, gulp, you know, just because, <laughs> having been in big pharma, you know, group, yeah. no, okay, it's probably a portion of their time, but still, that's a really substantial, and lots of, you know, tools and technologies that they're bringing in so that they do understand the whole picture when it's time to move in this area. Yeah, well, there was um, only a, a week or so ago, this, did you see the investment of Sniper Biome? So mm -hmm. the, that's like combining the CRISPR and <laughs> Great name for a company. <laughs> well, and 50 million yeah. uh, euros. Yeah. an amazing Series A. Yeah. yeah. So combined, I think, and I think the the principle there was um, they're looking to use CRISPR to target bad bacteria or, um, from the microbiome. So I don't know. Which I mean, is a phage approach, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they can work with you know in there too, and then yeah. uh, they can. Exactly. And they're all the perfect. I mean, they're very early stage, and they got a lot of money in their Series A. I mean, what? What? I mean, do you think they have? It's likely to be effective, or I mean, I'd be interested to hear what your views are on that. Depends on the team, and I don't know the team very well. But I mean, because mm -hmm. you know, you can have the best. I, I, my philosophy: you can have the best technology and the and a crappy team, or a crappy team with the best tech. You know what I mean? And uh, <laughs> the, a great team will make uh, make something of almost anything. They'll find the opportunity there. Scaling. I mean, the challenge with some large Series A can be scaling the company, how do you really hire fast enough and, you know, manage science and innovation um, in, a, uh, in a rapid way? I mean, there's a lot, there are pros who do it. There's companies like Denali in the, in the U.S. Um, and, uh, and others who, you know, with large slugs of cash move forward rapidly. I haven't seen many of the outputs of that yet, but I think uh, I wish them all the best, but I don't know if you guys have more of a perspective on the specifics of Sniper. No. Yeah. I mean, I do have a perspective because they're using phages as well, yeah? So I think it's just a field that that requires a lot of good science. Yeah? And yeah. I think using a CRISPR vector to shoot out, uh, if they're targeting a bacteria, the bacteria and activates sort of a self-destruction mechanism, it can work. Will it be more advantageous than using a self-replicating natural phage? I don't know. Mm. Will you have some of the same challenges in terms of you need to first infect the cell, so you need the receptor? You can have resistance against the receptor. You can have different receptors on different bacteria of the same species. So I think it's it's not a, a clear-cut answer. Yeah, and um, the same with with Locus, which is the the U.S. variant of that same mm. company. Mm -hmm. So I think again, I think that using phages is great. Yeah, and I think we need to understand in which disease indications are we using it, and whether the synthetic one works better than the natural one. We'll see. So I I know. Um Eric, you're working also a lot in the infectious disease space, and you've got the most advanced candidate, I believe, for the chikungunya um, vaccine. I mean, how's that going? I mean, I think you, we're expecting to see uh, results from you guys later this year um, on the next stage of your trial. Is that right? Uh, we, have start, we have completed and published the phase two, but we are starting the phase three now. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's uh, quite interesting is that uh, chikungunya is uh, maybe similar to some of the other infectious disease fields. Uh, quite some uh, overlooked threat mm. and uh, what we have seen now is uh, uh, outbreaks with uh, millions of people in the Caribbean uh, like people went to the honeymoon and came back in the wheelchair mm. Mm. and uh, so this uh, really put, put uh, more more flesh uh, to the disease than it uh, used to have but uh, we see quite a bit is that there's more understanding of uh, uh, of global health uh, issues now uh, to the finance world, but uh, this is strongly supported by organizations like the Gates family of funding mechanisms, let's call it like this. Like uh, we have an uh, impact investor who's part of our company. We have uh, strong ties with SAPI, which is an alliance uh, to prevent uh, 
outbreak diseases, uh, which, for instance, uh, the world was not willing uh, to pay for an Ebola vaccine until recently. Well, that, yes, and, I mean, that's uh, the point, yeah. So, so their, their aim now is really to uh, make vaccines before the outbreak is there. And this is quite helpful also for companies like us because it uh, helps us uh, to lobby uh, for a financial return uh, mm -hmm. to investors for something like this. And I believe uh, uh, companies like ours uh, uh, were quite successful by leveraging private investment with non-dilutive funding and went quite a, uh, quite a way and uh, hopefully uh, still a longer way. Hmm. I mean, it's true that uh, certainly there, there doesn't seem to be much urgency about these things until there's a massive outbreak like uh, Ebola <laughs> or Zika or something, and then suddenly everyone's like, where's the vaccine? <laughs> mm -hmm. We've got to develop it now. So, yes, I think it's obviously very important there. Um, so um, I wonder, Vanessa, if I could ask you a bit about um, what upcoming trends you think there might be more in the investment side of things, because I think see how things have, sure. have changed or what, what's new um, this year and next. Um, yeah. I think, um, so in terms of the technological trends, uh, oh, we've covered the waterfront, I think, pretty effectively in uh, the conversation so far. In terms of levels of invest investment um, and, you know, the tempo and mode of investment, I guess I would say, um, what we're seeing, we're kind of at an interesting moment right now because, you know, we were kind of at that point in late 2018 and, and early part of this year where, at least in the U.S., you know, Series A's have gone up and up and up in size and U.S. company valuations, private company valuations in our experience, the quality ones, again, have been rising pretty rapidly. Um, so one trend that I've certainly been seeing is more American venture folks becoming part of European syndicates. Uh, really with a recognition that I think the density, you know, fewer dollars chasing every good opportunity here on the continent or in the UK. Uh, so I think that's really favorable to a lot of us here in this room. Mm. Um, and I think that's actually, I don't want to sound regional because I actually think that's part of much more e of even like a, a globalization. We've always been a global field, but venture and company formation has a, very much of a local feel to it no matter where you are. Um, but I think that we're kind of finding an interesting balance of local, global coexisting. Mm. Uh, so that's certainly one trend that we've seen. Um, the whole aspect of, it, we've also seen, uh, I've been starting to see, you know, uh, valuations in Europe going up. And so then the question becomes, you know, where does, when does that differentiator stop? Um, but um, certainly I don't, you know, I continue to see uh, you know, larger and larger amounts of capital trending in for Series A's. The question, you know, I was going to say the question becomes where does money come from the, the, for the Series B's? Because I guess what's the number? It's like 2008, I think it was, well, the number has gone up like 50% for Series A's. So can you keep going with the Series B's like that? Thankfully, I mean, you do have, you know, here on the, here in Europe, you have folks like the Novo, um, Nova Holdings, who actually mm. have a you know seed fund to later stage fund capability. Then you had groups like Safanova, Medici, uh, raising you know growth funds or raising you know uh, the raising funds to allow them to invest in Series B, Cs, and beyond. So I feel like um, you know maybe things are, are really looking good that those increasing Series A investments are going to cascade into you know as com companies hopefully don't attrit uh, will mm. lead to nice follow-on investments and hopefully companies that eventually bring some therapeutics to patients. I mean, what about the IPO market? I mean, I think that at the end of last year, that uh, sort of <laughs> went a bit down. I, mean, I can't comment on that. You can't comment fair <laughs> enough. I'm bound to be wrong, practically. <laughs> no, it's, it seems uh, I think it feels very uncertain. Yeah, I mean, I, certainly towards the end of last year, a few people, yeah. I, I, think, I think you were, yourselves were considering it and then maybe decided to, to wait. But um, I don't know, can you comment on, on, yeah, on so, why so you what, thought uh, that? Yes, so what we... Uh, Know that time and uh, still know today is that uh, Europe and uh, the US are very separated mm -hmm. in uh, in our global world. It's uh, much easier for a mosquito infected with chikungunya to come from Africa <laughs> to Europe to infect somebody <laughs> than to bring American investors uh, to Europe. <laughs> and uh, uh, well. what we have seen uh, is uh, that. Uh, this trend of European uh, companies uh, to be expected to Nasdaq IPO is getting stronger and stronger every day. And uh, it's very nice to see the European stock exchanges fighting for young biotech companies to IPO in Europe, but I think this will be a fight they will lose. 
Uh, I, I, would, I would definitely echo that. I think if there's one thing you can say about the IPO market is that it's a lot hotter in the States than here. Yeah. Um, and that even if there's uncertainty that folks feel that there's still appetite for, for biotech investments, and that um, as you think even for a European biotech of why you choose in one place or the other, the, the capital market sophistication, meaning willingness to invest in follow-on rounds of publicly traded companies is vastly different in the mm. States versus here. So it may be a, you know, if you choose to list here, it may be a good near, feel like a good near-term decision, but what's gonna happen when you're out raising additional capital? What about more on the sort of exit side? Do you think there's much we can look forward to for that coming up? I think M&A will continue to be pretty, <laughs> from what I've seen, pretty hearty. Yeah, market. <laughs> okay. I mean, not mentioning any particular examples. No. One thing that I found interesting is that from sort of our investor side, I think everybody's feeling there's a bit of volatility at the moment. Nobody really knows how the year is going to turn out. Is yeah. everything going to be fine at the end? Are we entering a downturn? So we've actually received comments from our investors saying, why don't you fundraise now again? Yeah, I mean, uh -huh. do you want more money? We're happy to give it to you now because I'm, I'm not sure what your setting will be like, not ours as a company, but sort of the entire financing world setting will be like in a year or 18 months from now. Um, so I think there's a general feeling that we just don't know. Are we at the end of a cycle? Are we still good for a yeah. couple more years? It's an interesting volatility that, uh, that seems to be mm -hmm. out there. Interesting. Okay, I think this is a good point. If I don't know if anyone in the audience has any questions or wants to sort of join in and... Um, mention any trends you think you might have seen or have any questions for any of the speakers? No? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Echoing to, to what Werner said on, on the funding gap, mm -hmm. like, but more like on a short term, <clears throat> you, do you agree that it's still big or do you what, what do you see like on the funding gap uh, how will it evolve over the next yeah year I wish or two? Werner were still here because I was <laughs> gonna say I no, I think to some extent the funding gap is over just over uh, hyped M meaning I think we've gone a long way in the last 10 15 years of addressing it through you know venture folks in a way changing their models at least a lot of them so going from you know what i saw 10 15 years ago where someone would you know get a you know a professor a great innovation and go okay we're going to you know fund this with a series a and see where it goes to now where folks are, I think venture is playing a much larger role in closing the funding gap by doing things like, you know, when I was at Atlas um, uh, as an EIR, it was the time when that discovery in the Massachusetts uh, system, I don't know whether it was MGH or at, uh, where specifically, um, came where they, you know, took the blood from old mice and put it into, sorry, young mice and put it into old mice and it made them young, uh, seem younger. And so um, Atlas literally founded a seed company around that called Acelogen, which no longer exists, and went to reproduce the data, um, which is part of that funding gap, I think, which is going, okay, what of the scientific innovation in the labs is really ready for prime time? Now, since then, so basically they did the, ran the put a few hundred thousand dollars, ran the experiment. That company was then, you know, didn't go on and, and really have life. But at least we knew that where the science was at that moment wasn't sufficient to found a company around. Now that's, you know, there, you know, more research funding has continued to go into that area and I believe it's continued to evolve in the last few years. And I think that's a good example. So I think the funding gap is overrated because you have more and more um, venture folks and uh, that are working to take some of the most exciting technologies and, and see whether they're ready for prime time. I think if I were Werner arguing back to me, I would say, yeah, fine, but there's 3,500 diseases. How many atlases are there and other firms that are doing that? And, and I would say, yeah, I, you know, I agree, but um, but there's a lot of science out there that need that you need to kick the tires on multiple times before it's ready to become a company. I mean, at the same, at the end, the funding gap is also a selection criteria for the best biotech. Stack. Maybe Eric or Alexander, how do you, how did you pass it? And how yeah, did I, you I, I don't see a funding gap at all. So uh, <laughs> it's difficult to get funding, and uh, this is why we call it work. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've started a company 10 years ago, and uh, uh, in Australia, the first uh, uh, funding we got was from AWS, seed financing. Thank you, Arnold. <laughs> uh, and, since, and I was very happy, and I laid back and said, now I can do 
drug development and vaccine development and everything. But in reality, uh, I'm in fundraising for the last 10 years, uh, seven days a week. And uh, not because there is a funding gap, but because you need to find uh, different uh, vehicles. And I believe there's never been times where there are so many different vehicles around available. But uh, it's maybe a bit more difficult than to, just to, to uh, take it from the street. I mean, Sorry. one other thing I would add to that, um, to your point about different types of vehicles available, I mean, there's certainly ther some therapeutic areas also where I think you I think you need to have the discussion almost therapeutic area by therapeutic area in that uh, something like, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, par Parkinson's, other neuro neurodegenerative diseases, again, a, an area where to have you know, folks be willing to spend even a few hundred thousand or a million or two to do de-risking experiments, that's kind of, you have fewer of them because the path after that is harder. Um, and so that's why I think it's really exciting to have groups as, and again, to your point, like the Dementia Discovery Fund in the UK, um, you know, coming up, and as uh, Werner was saying, with uh, different patient groups giving more money to more translational activities, not just basic research labs, because I think that can play a huge role as well. Uh, yes, I'd like to ask Vanessa to clarify something she said earlier, and that was concerning the capacity in gene therapy. Mm -hmm. Were you referring to manufacturing capacity and yes. specifically to viral vectors? Um, not specific, uh, uh, I don't know specifically to viral vectors. I meant to bio, uh, biologics uh, manufacturing capacity beyond um, antibodies and traditional large molecules. I'm not close enough to the field. It's on, okay. Yes, hi, I'm Peter. Um, so there's, a, there's an issue I, I discovered which is disturbing. European biotech, mm. uh, 10 years ahead, we're looking at entrepreneurs. And I was at an event this week where students and professors met companies. And I asked professors, said, how do you manage to get talent, local talent, to start companies? And he said, I send them abroad. <laughs> And I thought that was a strange response because, you know, you should really try and found the company or set up a company in your own country, which you're in, or in this country. No, he says, I send them to the US. And I said, do they come back? And he couldn't reply. So uh, the question to the panel is, um, what are we going to do about European talent? And what can we do, not just to keep it here, but to bring entrepreneurs and financiers and get the people to encourage startups and get people to encourage financing young people to start companies? Good question. <laughs> I'm not sure we, we can fully answer that. Yeah, I think the, I think the best thing is always role models. Yeah, I think in the US you have a lot of role models. You have a lot of people that you can probably find and Google and see what they've been doing. In Europe, I'm not sure how many of those who could be role models talk about it or whether they are just not very visible, very active. I certainly know great Austrian entrepreneurs who would never put their face into a, a newspaper and who are then not visible. It, nobody knows that they sold an automation company for two billion um, euros yeah, because they just did it and, and there's maybe a very small press article. So I mean, I think if in Europe we can, in the biotech scene, find good companies and uh, um, then they can become role models, then that should help, again, showing others that it's possible. Mm. I think Vienna is a nice um, uh, example for role models and uh, uh, like I have uh, started uh, in the biotech industry, I don't know when was this, uh, 17, 18 years ago together with Werner uh, and uh, Intercell was one of the stars of the industry then and uh, had good and bad times and uh, many of the people who were at Intercell 20 years ago, started their own companies. So I believe they're, they're a nice example of role, of role models also in Europe, also in Vienna. And uh, what we also have in Austria is a very nice infrastructure to start or to help entrepreneurs in the beginning. But, but I, think I believe uh, role models and uh, infrastructure are quite important. But you also highlight, um, so I would say it's going to continue to be slow because your example highlights that this is you know, a decades-long mentorship or at least a five to seven-year-long mentorship. Um, so that says you know, automatically we're not going to you know, flip a switch and suddenly have a ton, but we need to be very deliberate about mechanisms like you're describing. I actually think 
um, but I'm biased here as a transplant from Boston back to actually Switzerland uh, two years ago. But that when I made that move, actually so many folks who'd gone from Europe to the US to be in part of the pharma industry or, bio, or biotech industry five, 10, 15, 20 years ago, we're like, oh, you're so lucky. You're going back to like this place because it's perceived as you know better lifestyle. You know, things are so close. It's beautiful history. You know, like so people are kind of like, wow, that's cool that there's a biotech industry to go back to there. So I think that that sort of almost expats returning. No, but you know, <laughs> sorry, I'm just yeah. telling you what I hear. Yeah. Um, no, but the, but what also spurred it for me is um, I spent a lot of time actually commuting up to Iceland. Um, back between like 2010 to 2012. And there, very interestingly, they send all of their medical students and a lot of their PhD students to either other places in Europe or to the States. And they all go back because the pull of home, or not all, sorry, a very large number of them go back because the pull of home is so strong. And that makes a very vibrant ecosystem. So I think um, there's a lot, there, there is some potential there as well. Okay, perhaps uh, one more question. Anybody else? Okay, if we don't have any more questions, then I'd like to, uh, to finish by um, asking each of you um, what you sort of hope to see in European biotech by 2020, if you could pick one thing. Sorry, it's a bit broad, but uh, uh. sky's the limit. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Maybe regulatory agencies uh, um, should... Uh, transform, uh, understand science better than they do now? Mm -hmm. That's okay, my good answer. <laughs> Anyone else? I, I think, to me, I think what would be exciting to see is if um, we don't just focus that much on the buzzwords that are out there, but try and figure out what the real medical needs are that are out there. And mm -hmm. so I think we have a lot of fields that receive uh, very little attention. We have a few fields that receive a ton of attention, um, and that's just not going to be good for our medicine in mm. the long run. So I think the more we can rebalance that, and it might need government incentives, it might need other actors to, to help with that, the more we can rebalance that, I think the better for all of us in, in the long term. Great. And where you're kind of the anti-hype answer, I'm going to go for the hype answer. <laughs> I was going to say like three or four more app linkses, I think would do wonders for the industry. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank for coming you. today. Thank that you. was a great discussion. <laughs> <laughs>